Club Challenge. We're looking at the attributes of God today. So let's pray. Father, thanks for uh, this day of giving us. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the study. It is uh, been life changing for me, and I pray it be life changing for others. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we would just keep our eyes on you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the attributes of God, why I like this study and why it's really changed my life is um, because when you and I have an understanding of who God is, it allows us to kind of like get through the storms of this life. Uh, it allows us to, um, you know, some of the times where maybe we have moments of, is God real? How do I know God is fill in the blank? And um, when you and I, know who he is, um, his character, and, 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 the, and those types of, actually his attributes, then we are reminded, and that allows us to continue to lean on him. So, attribute number one. So pretty much there's 10 attributes that I'm going to share with you today. Um, these aren't like, I wouldn't say these are like, these are not the only uh, 10 attributes of God here. These are uh, 10 attributes that I have found valuable over the years through one of the studies that I do. And um, through the studies that I do, um, I just keep going back to these. Some people have used other ones. Some have more, some have less. But here's 10 attributes of God that I would like to share. Number, and I'm going to share with you what they are, a definition, and then some scripture references. So if anyone likes this, more happy, copy and paste it. I'll, I'll, share, with you, I'll share with you the notes. Um, but uh, I go back to these are on my blog page as well. So um, if you if you want to waste some more time, you go to marksalazar.wordpress.com. I think something like that. But anyways, now point number one, God is sovereign. Definition, the word sovereign means chief, highest, or supreme. When we say that God is sovereign, we're saying that he is the number one ruler in the universe. Um, there's a couple reference verses, Psalm 103.19, 2 Samuel 7.28. And then First Chronicles 29, 10 uh, to 13. So I'm going to look at Chronicles. I'm going to look at one verse um, with y'all, and then I have other references if you want to look later. And like I said, more than happy to shoot out an email, or I'll put them in my notes. How about that? I'll just post them. So First uh, Chronicles 29, 10 to 13. David prays this prayer in the assembly of the people. So he is proclaiming this to the people. Check this out. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Now, I don't know about you, but if you don't know that God is sovereign, you ain't going to pray like that. And the encouragement is, if you do know that God is sovereign, what, do our prayer, what is our prayer like? If we do know that God is in total control, think about it. So I think about like the boldness of this prayer is awesome, but it's because he, David knows that God is sovereign. And so I want us to think that way. If we truly believe that God is sovereign, what does that do to our belief uh, in the word? What does that do to how we live out the word? What does that do to our prayer life? So all these attributes kind of like they feed off each other. And, and those are the thoughts. Like if this is true, if this is real, how does it affect everything else? So, um, super important that we uh, we do that. And hold on, get some feedback here. Oh, I am on Google today, so let me do a quick check. Uh, am I not letting you in? Should be on the link. All right, my bad. So here we go. Point number two: God is eternal. There has never been a time when God did not exist. God is eternal. There has never been a time when God did not exist. He has no beginning. He has no end. Isaiah 44, 6. Um, there's Revelation 1, 8. There is 1 Timothy 1, 17. I'm going to read Isaiah 44, 6. Isaiah 44, 6 says, 
Thus says the Lord, King of Israel, and his, uh, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. He is the first and he is the last. He is the Alpha, the Omega. Um, and so uh, and he says, besides me, there is no God. I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. God is eternal. Do we believe that he truly is eternal? Um, point number three, God is omniscient. God is omniscient, meaning God possesses all the knowledge there is to have. There, uh, nothing ever takes him by surprise. God possesses all the knowledge. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. Um, so the, the crazy thing is sometimes we tend to hide from God, right? Like, oh, like God doesn't know. God knows everything. He possesses all knowledge and nothing takes him by surprise. God is not shocked when you and I sin. God is not shocked at the things that we do. He understands. He knows. Hebrews 4.13, Job 42.2, and Isaiah 40, verses 12 to 14. I'm going to look up Hebrews 4.13. Hebrews 4.13. Oops, went just too far. Hebrews 4.13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of, of him to whom we give, must give an account. So Hebrews 4.13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all are all naked and open to the eyes of him who we must give an account. Man. So God is sovereign, God is eternal, God is omniscient, and number four, God is omnipresent. God is infinite and everywhere throughout all space and time. God is infinite and everywhere throughout all space and time. We have Jeremiah 23, 24, we have Proverbs 15, 3, we have Deuteronomy 31, 6, we have Colossians 1, 17. I'm going to read from Jeremiah 23, 24. Jeremiah 23, verse 24 says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? And you, as we begin to look at God's word, think about this. God is omnipresent. He's all everywhere. We cannot hide from him. Does not the presence of the Lord fill heaven and earth? Does, his, does he not fill the heavens and the earth? There is nowhere that we can go where the Lord is not. The Lord knows where we're at. He knows what we do, so we can't hide. Um, and so God is not shocked at our sin. He's not like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that Mark did that. I can't believe that RJ did that or whoever it may be. And so just want to encourage you that that there's, there's no place, there's nothing that we do that God is unaware of, and there's nowhere that we can hide and get away from it. God knows all. He sees all. He knows our hearts. He knows everything. He's, he's all-knowing, right? He is all everywhere. And number five, he's um, omnipotent, or I like to say it, omnipotent. So the word omni is all, and then potent is power, right? So God is all powerful, having more. Check this out. God is all powerful, having more than enough strength to do the sum total of all things. More, he has more power to do the He has more, he is all powerful, having more than enough strength to do the sum total of all things. So in, in my limited, finite mind, I think about power in a couple of different ways. You can think of power just like brute strength power, weightlifting power. You can think about power as far as like maybe electricity or force, energy, whatever it is. Imagine the sum total of all of it. Imagine all the power. Think about electricity. I got a, uh, a text today from SDG&E, my electric company, saying, hey, there might be some power outages here and there. Imagine all the power being used together at one time just in one city of San Diego. Then you say all of California, all the United States, around the whole world. And then God still has more. God has more. So there's several verse references. There's Philippians 3, 20 to 21, Psalm 147 to 5. I'm going to look at Ephesians 3, 20. Ephesians got reasons Ephesians 3:20 and it says this and now to him who is able to him is is God right to him 
who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask or think according to the power at work within us. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, uh, and I think that the Amplifies is super abundantly, that we can even ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. So we have the power of living God inside of us. When you and I believe on Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the living God inside of us, but yet we forget about it. So like I said, these attributes here are there as a reminder of, of who God is. There's days you're going to have doubts. There's, there's days you're going to have fear. There's days you're going to wonder. There's days you're going to say, God, are you even real? And when you and I remember that God is sovereign, that he is in, in total control, that God is eternal. There's never been a time when God didn't exist. He has no beginning. He has no end. That God is om omniscient. He's all knowledge. That God is omnipresent. He's all everywhere. He's all present. When you, you and I remember that God is all powerful. Those are the things that are sometimes game changers that remind you uh, and I of who God is and how we can trust him. Point number six, God is immutable, immutable. Um, God never changes in his nature or attributes. And it's important for us to know God never changes in his nature or attributes. Um, there's several references there. There's Numbers 23, 19. There's Psalm 102, 27. I want to look at Hebrews 13, 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Now, a lot of our upbringing has a lot to do sometimes with our, our views of, of who the Lord is, um, both good and bad, by the way. And, and, and I know sometimes if you had a, a, maybe a rough upbringing, or maybe didn't know the Lord, and our example, our, our thoughts, we, we tend to think of the Lord through the lens of our father figure, like I said, both, both good and bad. And so um, there's times where, Someone has, there's our people who have obstacles looking at the Lord because they, maybe they had not a good relationship with their parents or their, or their father. And then they've carried that over into God. And we think that, that God is just like our parents. And so the reason why I like um, God being immutable, he never changes in nature or his attribute is that he doesn't change. That when I serve a God who remains the same, and that should bring comfort. And a lot of times, in the world we live in today, we want justice, we want fairness, we want all those things. By the way, we don't, we, re we truly don't want those things because if we really wanted justice and fairness, that means we want that back to ourselves. And if we go back to ourselves and who we are, guess what? Uh, we're worse than we thought. And then we're, that means that we would receive due justice. Ultimately, if we want true justice, that means that we face the wrath of God. But then that's where Christ comes in, right? Uh, because of his great love for us, even yet while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's where we have mercy and grace. So here's the reality. God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, forever. And that should be really a strong point for trusting in the Lord, that we can trust a God who doesn't change um, in his nature nor his attributes. God is not going to be just one day and then not the other day, or just for one person and not the other person. Um, God in his nature and attributes, they remain the same. He's not going to be omnipresent one day and not the other day. So these are all things that are um, strong points for us to continue to believe. Point number seven, God is righteous. God is righteous. Here's the definition of righteous, at least the one that I have. It is impossible for him to do or cause anything that is wrong. It is impossible for God to do or cause anything that is wrong. And like I said, we have several scripture references. Um, we have Isaiah 45, 20 to 25. We have Psalm 111, 1 to 2. And we have 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I'm going to camp out in Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy, there's a good reference here. Deuteronomy 32, 4. Deuteronomy 32, 4. Oh, yeah, 32. Oh, good thing I double checked my notes. Here we go. 32.4. It says, The Rock. I heard reference to God, The Rock. That is, he is The Rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just 
and upright is he. Man, think about that. The rock. God's work is perfect. All his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Friends, we have to continue to look at scripture and meditate on scripture and be reminded that our God is our rock. His work is perfect. It's not just good. It's not just great. It's perfect. All of his ways are justice. All of his ways are just. He is faithful without iniquity. He's just and upright. We, we, we have to be reminded of this. And we're not just telling ourselves this because that's what we're supposed to believe. This is who God is. This is his very being. And scripture is consistent. As we look at who God is, everything that we read in scripture is consistent with this. Um, and why don't we look at Isaiah 45, 20. I actually have it typed out here, so I'm going to look at that too. Um, it says, assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell them to bring forth your, your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God besides me? A just God and Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall shall take an oath, and he shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and shall be ashamed who are incensed, who are incensed against him. Verse 25. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. I'll read this, Psalm 111, verse 1 to 3. Psalm 111, verse 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for, for, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So think about that. All those things we're reading about, the righteousness, all of that, and when it comes down to it, guess what? For he, God, made him, Jesus, to who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ. Man, that's the great exchange. And what did you and I do to earn this or, or to deserve this? Absolutely nothing. But because of his mercy, because of his love for us, Man, I don't know about you, but we we serve a mighty God, and if you and if you're not walking with Christ, you're missing out. Let me tell you that. Point number eight: God is just. God is just. Meaning, it's impossible for Him to do anything that is unfair, either to Himself or to man. I'll read it again: It's impossible for God to do anything that is unfair to Himself or to man. We have 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 to 10, 2 Timothy 4 to 8, and I'm going to read Revelation 15, 3 and 4. Revelation, last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. I see what's up, Mr. Todd Householder. How's it going, man? The Revelation 15, 3. And they sing the song of Moses, a servant of God, and sing, or in the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Uh, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Just and true are your ways. God is just. God is righteous. Point number nine, God is love. God is love. God is perfect, infinite love. So we're finite. He's infinite. God is perfect, infinite love. His love is given freely and without any consideration 
of the loveliness or merit of the object. His love is given freely without consideration of the loveliness or the uh, merit of the object. So for some of us, that's that that's excellent news, right? That God's like, oh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I don't know if I can love this person. Um, you know, they're ugly or or whatever. So or I don't know, I don't know if I love this person because of this or that. Like his love is given freely, and it's without the consideration of the loveliness or merit of the object. So there's the real, and so what's is cool is there's no like comparison uh, of. Or there's no like, oh, this person should get it, this person shouldn't. Um, it's not based off of that. We have John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have 1 John 3, 16, and we have Romans 8, 37 to 39. I'm going to highlight Romans 8, uh, 37 to 39. It says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing. His love is perfect, infinite love. Perfect, infinite love. There is no love like this on planet Earth. So... I uh, just want to encourage you, God's love is different. A lot of times, like I said, we bring the past, we, we bring failed relationships, all that into the picture. God is not like that. He's perfect. He's just. He's holy. He's sovereign. He's infinite. We have to look at these things. His love is incomparable. Last but not least, number 10, God is veracity. Veracity, which is absolute truth. God is veracity. I mean, he is absolute truth. A couple years ago, not a couple years ago, gosh, how long ago? 15, 15, 18 years ago, somewhere in that ballpark, um, I had this kid who showed up to youth ministry. And he's like, hey, yo, Pastor Mark, I like my outfit, man. And I was like, it's ugly. <laughs> he was like, what are you talking about? I said, uh. Yo, who, put, who picked them out for you? You just, like, open the drawer, throw them on. And uh, I'm like, you colorblind or something? He says, actually, I am. I was like, oh, snap. So um, he was wearing, like, you know, like, purple pants with, like, a goofy striped sweater, like, orange and red and yellow. It was the ugliest thing. And, and I don't know if his sister is messing with him or not, but it was, like, the ugliest outfit ever. And it did not match. And... Here's a question. His purple pants that he wore, that he was wearing, although he may have seen purple as something different, does that change the reality of what they really were? No. There is an absolute truth on the color of those pants. He may have seen them differently, but that doesn't change the actual color. And, you know, I've learned over the years of doing flyers and stuff that when you start – um, addressing colors, like especially for ink to print, each color has a code like R527651 is a certain shade of blue or whatever. So like when you start using colors, there is an exact absolute color match for a scheme of things. I wanted to think about it like that. And so th this kid, and he was trying to have a, you know, swagalicious outfit, and it wasn't. Um, he had his colors all wrong. His view, his perception was wrong, but there was a truth to the color. And the truth was is um, he had a jacked up outfit. So that being said, a lot of us are spiritually colorblind. We see things the way we want to, whether it's ourselves and hard heart or our mind. We don't want to accept the truth or whatever, but let me tell you something. There is absolute truth. And it's interesting how people in this world fight veracity. They fight absolute truth. What depends on what you believe, right? They want you to believe what they want to believe, which is a lie, but they don't want you to think that there's absolute truth. Friends, there is an absolute truth. There is a God. He is absolute truth. That's the definition. That, the definition of God is veracity is that he, God, God is absolute truth. He is truth. He is the way, the truth, the life. Um, Psalm 33, 4. It says for the Lord for the word of the Lord is right 
and all his work is done in truth. The word of the Lord is right. It is veracity, is absolute truth, and his work is done in truth. Uh, Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life with God who cannot lie, promised before time began. God promised before time began that he cannot lie. God cannot lie. God will not lie. God has not lied. God will not lie. God, that's not who he is. He is truth. He's absolute truth. Last but not least, John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth of the gospel, the truth, will set you free. It'll save you. It'll save you from sin. It'll save you from the wrath of God. The truth shall set you free. Do you know the truth? Do you know the gospel? Do you know that God loved you? so much that he sent his one and only son to take on your sin, to take on my sin. Took it on himself because he loved you. He takes on sin to take on the full wrath of God. So, friends, I want to encourage you. I hope you know that truth. And I hope that these, these, these ten attributes, that God is sovereign, that God is eternal, that God is omniscient, that God is omnipresent, that God is omnipotent, that God is immutable, right? God is immutable, that God is just, that God is righteous, that God is love, God is veracity. And those things would be an encouragement, not just for today, but for your entire life. This has been, when I came across this a few years into my walk, this has been life-changing. I go back to this all the time. I'm not feeling it. I go back to the attributes of God. This has been... Uh, life-changing for me, and I, I hope it's life-changing for you. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thanks for our time together. Thank you for your word, and Lord, uh, and thankful for who you are. Lord, thank you that we're not having uh, a blind faith. We're putting our, our, our faith into the facts. Uh, we're putting our, our faith into a, a real God who, who loved us and came down from heaven to earth to rescue us and to save us. And, Lord, you're mighty to save. There's, there's, there's no place we can go. There's nothing that we can do that would separate us so far that you wouldn't forgive us. So, Father, help us to remember of your faithfulness. Help us to remember that you are true. And, Lord, help us remember maybe some of us have been wronged in, in the worst way. Help us to know that every single one of us, including us, even us in our sins, are going to be um, standing in front of a holy, perfect, righteous, just God, and none of us, None of us are going to get away with the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Lord, help us to have a trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.